All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, uh, everyone, my name is Ryan Rogers. I'm the program manager of uh, student success here at Iowa Campus Compact. So I'm going to go over uh, just kind of an overall supervisor orientation to the Campus Compact AmeriCorps program. Uh, on the agenda today, uh, it's really just an introduction to Campus Compact AmeriCorps. I talk a little bit about Volunteer Iowa, which is our grantor. Uh, then we'll go into the host site obligations, permitted activities, member allowable activities, uh, some additional supervisor obligations. Uh, talk a little bit about reporting and then the enrollment and exiting processes um, for the program and for your AmeriCorps members that you'll be um, enrolling. Uh, one of the very first things that I'll kind of point out to all of our returning uh, supervisors is that um, there is a name change. So um, you may have been familiar with ICAP or Iowa, Iowa College AmeriCorps program. So another uh, program is uh, Campus Compact AmeriCorps. So you start to see that lingo um, everywhere on a lot of our different marketing and all the emails that I send to you. So if you see Campus Compact AmeriCorps or CCA, uh, that is formerly ICAP. So that's kind of that we're going with right now. So um, at any point, you can always just um, raise your virtual hand or just kind of chime in if you have any questions along the way. It should be pretty informal and we should get the, through this pretty quickly. Uh, I haven't slated for like an hour, but we may get through this in about 30 minutes or so. But again, if you have any questions at all, definitely uh, raise your virtual hand or just speak up and I can definitely answer for you. Uh, going forward, so uh, contact information. So one of the other things that's kind of changed a little bit for any of our uh, returning supervisors is uh, a little bit of from role changes uh, with a lot of people in our office. So if you have any questions around uh, grant management, uh, host site agreements, financial management, uh, and compliance, uh, you've reached out to Justin. So Justin is our Director of Development in Iowa Operations. So any kind of questions surrounding that, definitely reach out to him. Uh, once you have your members, uh, anything to do with member training, orientations, uh, management and compliance, behavioral things, uh, and then even performance me measured data, uh, either from the member or with the site, uh, you can contact me, for, uh, contact me for that kind of information. I'm here really just to make sure that your members are really successful in the program, that you're successful in the program. So anything that I can do uh, really to just orient your members compliance wise, management of those members and sites, uh, please let me know. And then uh, our newest person, Carly Bonson, you probably have already heard a lot from her. So she's doing a lot of the day in day kind of administrative tasks with this uh, program now. So member management, particularly uh, pertaining to timesheet monitoring. Uh, member enrollment, so all the paperwork that kind of goes into enrolling uh, an AmeriCorps member, as well as the exit paperwork. She'll be kind of collecting that and making sure that all of those items are present in their file um, at the start of their service and then even at the end of their service. And then she'll also be helping out with any kind of data collection as well. So those are kind of the three people who are on this grant who are here to uh, assist you. So definitely reach out to us. At any point, uh, we always say, you know, the more uh, communicative you are to us, the more we can definitely help and support you kind of along the way. So with that, um, I'll start just by quickly going over just who we are, if you don't already know who we are uh, fully. So Iowa Campus Compact, our whole mission is just to strengthen colleges and universities to prepare all students to become uh, engaged citizens. Uh, vision is just to strengthen that coalition, um, to provide leadership for the civic mission of higher education. So we do faculty programs. We have two different AmeriCorps programs, which I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, we help campuses with days of service. So anything kind of in that community engagement realm, that's kind of what we exist as an organization to help campuses uh, to do. So after that, I'll talk a little bit about AmeriCorps. So AmeriCorps is with uh, Corporation for National and Community Service. So you might hear us uh, talk about CNCS, that's who we're referring to. So under CNCS are uh, several different programs. So AmeriCorps is one of those programs and there's different branches of AmeriCorps. So uh, three branches, AmeriCorps State and National. So that's technically what the Campus Compact AmeriCorps um, opportunity, this opportunity, uh, that's what it sits underneath. So all of your AmeriCorps members will be AmeriCorps State and National members. 
Uh, we also uh, have a AmeriCorps VISTA program as well, and that's another branch of AmeriCorps with a summer opportunity with summer uh, VISTA available. Um, AmeriCorps VISTA is all around alleviating poverty, so a lot of the VISTA members that are in our program are placed directly at uh, community organizations uh, to do the year of service, um, their year of service. Uh, and then there's also AmeriCorps NCCC. We don't have that program, uh, but there's a very strong program of, uh, for that in Iowa. And it's from 18 to 22 or 24 year olds. Uh, they all live together. It's kind of a very intensive AmeriCorps experience. So they go around the country and do different service projects. And um, uh, especially during natural disasters, those are really the first ones that are kind of on the ground helping out. Um, in that area. So NCCC, a really good program with AmeriCorps. Um, also underneath a corporation, our CNCS is Senior Corps, so that includes foster grandparents, senior companions, and RSVP. And then there's also a volunteer generation fund as well. So as Iowa Campus Compact, we have an AmeriCorps State National Grant, we have an AmeriCorps grant, and then we also have a volunteer generation fund as well. So those are the kind of uh, three different ones that we operate here at Iowa Campus Compact. And then the last group I want to talk about is Volunteer Iowa. So there are a grantor for this grant. So uh, Volunteer Iowa just really wants to have a relationship with all of our host sites. Um, oh, I still have ICAP in there, so it should be CCA. But uh, really just have a, um, a relationship with us as well as with the host sites, so you guys, as well as your service sites. So at certain points during uh, the year, they might reach out to you. They like to do different evaluations, member surveys, uh, they usually do a supervisor online email focus group as well. So uh, definitely if they reach out to you, it would definitely help us out a lot if you just respond to that, uh, have your members respond to the surveys that they send out. It really helps us uh, with our grant and our grant planning for the future as well. So those are kind of the introduction to three kind of uh, big players and uh, big groups to really talk about in the beginning. Are there any questions so far? I know it's a lot of information right now, but are there any questions? Not seeing any, which is a good sign. So I will go forward here. So what separates uh, an AmeriCorps position from a volunteer position? So hopefully as you're developing your position descriptions, and we have a template that's available that you'll be filling out what the duties that the AmeriCorps member will be doing. It's really structured so that it's a project-based um, uh, they're very project-based, so all the activities are really structured like that. So making sure those duties are project-based, uh, members must meet the minimum requirements uh, for the program to receive the financial benefit. So that's that education award. So depending on what kind of member that you have, you may have a 300-hour member, a 900 or a 1,700-hour member. Uh, they have to complete all of those hours to receive that education award at the very end of their service. Uh, and the duties are tied to uh, federal statute, so making sure that um, it's really the federal statute for non-duplication and non-displacement of uh, current employees or volunteers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but just making sure they're not duplicating any efforts or displacing any other person that's currently at a site uh, that they are serving at during their time. Uh, another thing I wanna kind of go over is our theory of change. So I won't go over this entire uh, kind of block here, but I always direct supervisors, uh, especially new supervisors, to the uh, last block there, just our long-term uh, outcome. So our whole goal is just for organizations to improve their capacity to provide better and uh, more direct services to the communities and or to just uh, receive better and direct services to the benefit beneficiaries uh, that they are serving. So that's a whole point to the program. Uh, if they're gonna be at a specific community organizations, it's really gonna be focused on capacity building. And I actually have a definition from CNCS of kind of how they view capacity building, but that's really uh, the heart of the program. It's a lot of indirect service, it's a lot of developing, enhancing, uh, creating new things for organizations, even for your campus. So uh, that's kind of the point to the program, capacity building, indirect service. Uh, if they're going to be on campus, uh, we really see members really assisting or advancing or improving um, the civic action plan that your, um, your campus may have or is working on. So that's kind of how we have it separated up. So part of the members will be on campus and then some part of the members will actually be out in the community doing capacity building type of efforts. So those are the two different little uh, slots that we have our um, 
CCA members kind of working on this year for the grant. Any questions about the theory of change or anything that you see on the, uh, on the uh, screen there? Nope, all right, so host site obligations. So uh, member orientation should be led by the uh, Iowa Campus Compact staff. So when I talk about the enrollment process, um, I'll talk a little bit more about, we'll do the member orientation. So we'll orient them to the program. We'll get them all set up to be AmeriCorps members. So we'll handle all of that for you. Uh, assisting uh, IAC in conducting site visits for service sites. So if you will have members that are gonna be placed out in the community at different uh, community organizations, uh, I would really love during some point in the year to actually do a site visit to those sites and be able to just sit down with them, see what the AmeriCorps member is doing, see what kind of things are happening there, and just kind of uh, record that and maybe even snap some pictures as well. We have a quick question here. Will you share the capacity building definition when you have a chance? Absolutely, here, yeah. So I actually have the definition in this uh, PowerPoint here uh, in the next few slides or so, but yeah, I'll definitely share that with you as well. Um, so yeah, so if you have um, members that are gonna be out in the community, um, at some point I'll reach out to you to see if I can set up a site visit with some of those service sites, just so it, uh, we can introduce ourselves um, to each other and then talk a little bit about what the member is doing at that site. So we, we would like to have a little bit more of a uh, uh, relationship with those service sites just to make sure that um, the member is doing awesome work there, which I'm sure that they're doing, but uh, just kind of capture that a little better for this year. Uh, placement sites are public organizations, not solely uh, focused on like, advocacy and lobbying or any other permitted activities. So next few slides, I'll talk about the permitted activities and um, just making sure that we're just kind of following that template of uh, what's an allowable site for an AmeriCorps member. Uh, release members from service uh, for the Civic Action Academy. So that's something that um, should have been mentioned in your host site agreement. So uh, all members are required to go to the Civic Action Academy. So that's going to be at uh, University of North, uh, North Iowa. Sorry, I'm joking. I'm in Florida. And um, it's going to be November 8th and the 9th. So that's a Friday and a Saturday. So that is a requirement. So just releasing them from service if they happen to be on your uh, campus uh, doing, time, uh, doing your service, then um, just releasing them to be able to attend that uh, academy. And what it is, it's just a big training, a student leadership and civic engagement type of uh, conference. Uh, many of the sessions are student led, but we have some um, community engagement professionals there leading uh, sessions as well. So just releasing them to be able to attend that. Um, they can attend just one day or, you know, just a Friday or a Saturday. We encourage them to attend both days to that. Um, their registration is waived, so we cover the registration cost. And uh, we do have some funding for travel as well. So we can either um, reimburse the member themselves or if you bring down you know, a, a whole uh, van load of them uh, to the event, uh, we can actually reimburse your office as well. So but that is a requirement for this year. If for whatever reason a member can't actually make this, uh, definitely reach out to us so that we can uh, figure out some other ways for them to get some of those trainings um, in as a part of their service. And then the very last one is just member performance issues are communicated with us uh, in a timely manner. So if anything happens or anything comes up with your member, uh, something happens with the site or just anything comes up that may affect uh, the member's uh, performance or their ability to successfully exit the program, just letting us know as soon as possible. And then just some other uh, benefits uh, for host sites. So we'll facilitate the member orientations, uh, member trainings, uh, for returning supervisors, that's actually been lessened a little bit. So uh, in the past, there used to be required trainings on community engagement, um, uh, effective communication, a national disaster, um, as well as volunteer uh, management. All of those requirements are no longer um, required. So volunteer um, Iowa kind of uh, got rid of all of those. So really the only required trainings that they uh, need to complete are the timekeeping training, as well as using your education award. And both of those will actually be taken care of during the orientation or towards the end of their service. I will actually provide those to the members. 
So really any other type of training that they receive, they still need to take record of. So you'll still have a, um, a training certification form and that's how we capture all different trainings or professional development that they um, claim on their timesheets. Um, we still need a record of any other training because they can still count those trainings towards their three, 300 hours or 1700 hours of service. So whatever I requirement that they uh, have, but they have been lessened. Uh, monitoring of member timesheets. So Carly will primarily be focused on monitoring timesheets. So making sure that uh, they're not recording hours like on holidays unless it's already been specified and we know about it or um, there's no excessive hours in there. There are some limits to uh, how many hours you can put on your timesheets. And I'll go over that specifically during the timekeeping training on Friday. Um, and I'll go over kind of all the different stipulations with uh, what can go on a timesheet, what can't go on to a timesheet. And then the review of member position descriptions. So I'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but uh, just reviewing those, we will review those position descriptions just to make sure that uh, there's no period activities happening um, and making sure everything is allowable on there as well. And then just additional, just recruitment support, uh, consultations. So um, if you need some training, so I can always come onto a campus and do some type of a uh, leadership, a leadership uh, training for your AmeriCorps members, civic engagement training. Uh, we do that all the time. General consultation, outreach, and then just financial benefits. Uh, some of you are actually receiving uh, personnel funding because of this grant. So that's something new that we are doing this year. Um, so paying, uh, helping to fund a part of a staff person's time at your campus to be able to uh, administer this program. So that's something that we're really excited about. And uh, we have a few of you who've actually taken um, advantage of that opportunity. We hope to offer that again for next year. And then Civic Action Academy travel support for uh, CCA members. So again, their registration is waived for that. And we have some travel support for those members to actually attend. So um, it is a requirement. So definitely let us know if there's any reason that a member uh, cannot um, come to that uh, training. Any questions about the uh, host site obligations overall? All right, so not saying any. So permitted activities. So um, all of these permitted activities are uh, in your host site agreement. So uh, I won't go over them too much here. Uh, I'll really go over just the big ones that we normally see on campuses. I go over these with the member at the orientation as well, just to make sure that they are aware of it. Another requirement that we have for this year is that um, uh, many, many of you already know that uh, the AmeriCorps uh, poster or some kind of um, promotional uh, uh, sticker or something needs to be present at the host site, kind of notifying people that there's an AmeriCorps member serving here. So that was always been a requirement. Another requirement this year is that these permitted activities have to be posted at your host site as well. So it has to be posted at your campus. We'll actually take care of that. So we actually developed a poster that will just need to be um, posted somewhere um, in your office or somewhere in the vicinity, uh, just so that the AmeriCorps member, everyone knows what the permitted activities of um, their AmeriCorps service is. Uh, so we'll provide those to you uh, when I uh, go out to your campuses and do the uh, pre-service orientations for your members. I can bring uh, those for you. But some of the big ones, as a lot of you may know, so the AmeriCorps member can't count any of their hours towards advocacy, lobbying, uh, engaging in any political partisan activities. Uh, they can't engage in any religious instruction, worship services, Bible studies. Uh, they can absolutely uh, do their service at a, at a faith-based organization. They just can't count their hours towards any of those um, type of activities. Uh, they can't count their hours or um, be placed at any business that's organized for profit organize any uh, voter registration drives, be a part of any voter registration drives, or any organization providing abortion services or referrals at all. So those are kind of the big ones that we've seen over the last few years that really pertain uh, to you all. So we'll look over the position descriptions. That's really one of the main things that we're looking over, um, trying to find in those position descriptions, is just if any of these things are actually occurring. And that's when we'll send back edits to you just to, uh, try to figure out another way for the member to uh, serve uh, during that time. 
Uh, but again, these are all in your host site agreement, and then we'll send you a poster or, or a little sheet uh, that you can actually post that has all of these kind of outlined as well. Uh, some other things to think about with this. So an AmeriCorps member, they can't, uh, any of the uh, community volunteers that they may recruit for a specific project that they're uh, doing, uh, they also can't do any of these prohibited activities. Um, not any volunteers that maybe your site recruits, but if a AmeriCorps member is specifically recruiting volunteers for a project that they're working on, then they can't recruit them to then do these things either. So uh, keep that in mind. This applies to us at uh, Iowa Campus Combat as well. So anyone who is completely funded with this uh, grant, so that would be me, uh, Justin, Carly, uh, any of you who are receiving that personnel support. So any, um, any kind of uh, service or work that, are, that is funded by the AmeriCorps grant during that time, you can't do these activities as well. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, at the very bottom there, any community volunteers that was recruited by the AmeriCorps member. And then the last thing that I always um, stress to the AmeriCorps member at the orientation is that um, it also can't appear like you are an AmeriCorps member doing these things. So the best example that I can give would be, um, uh, they're all gonna get AmeriCorps uh, t-shirts. So they have really cool t-shirts this year. So they're all get one of those. So not showing up to a voter registration drive, registering people to vote with that t-shirt on. So just making sure it doesn't appear like they are on the clock as an AmeriCorps member doing any of these prohibited activities. So uh, consequences for this, so the AmeriCorps member could actually lose their position um, outright. Um, they can also lose their education award even after the fact. So if uh, Volunteer Iowa decides to um, go to one of the service sites just to see, you know, what kind of great work the AmeriCorps member did. And the site supervisor there says, you know, oh yeah, you know, there's so-and-so, she did, you know, they did an amazing job. They registered like 5,000 people to vote, you know, it was great. So if that were to happen, then even after the fact uh, that AmeriCorps member either won't have access to that education award if they didn't already uh, use it, or they may have to pay back that education award to the federal government. Um, for Iowa Campus Compact, it's a lot of costs, repayment of those costs to volunteer Iowa, uh, a loss of the grant outright. Um, for host sites, and this is uh, in your host site agreement, uh, possible repayment of the cost that we would have to pay. Um, but really at the very bottom there for the field and for the community, it's just a loss of an opportunity, loss of great help for the community and public trust in this type of funding. So uh, that's why we definitely want to look at those position descriptions and um, really um, be able to get in front of your service sites just to make sure that um, no kind of permitted activities are happening um, at any of these AmeriCorps sites um, that they're going to be at. Uh, any questions just about the permitted activities? I know this is familiar to a lot of people, but if you have any questions at all, definitely uh, you can put it in the chat or you can even email me after the fact. But again, we'll send out a poster that has all of these. And again, we'll be reviewing all of the position descriptions just to make sure. Um, everything is okay of um, where the member is going to be serving at. So different monitoring that will happen. So if you think your member is doing something permitted, uh, definitely uh, contact us. Uh, usually the situation that happens is that if a member is doing something that is permitted, uh, we would determine which hours and then we'll have the member remove those hours. Even before then though, we'll actually work with Volunteer Iowa to really determine if the activities truly are uh, not allowed. Uh, sometimes they are allowed, there just needs to be like a clear um, kind of line in the sand just to make sure that uh, the member is not doing certain activities at that organization. But if something is found, uh, we'll usually open up those timesheets, have them remove those hours, and then we'll work with you and the member just to develop a plan to make sure that they can still complete their term of service. So. Um, they'll have their uh, agreements that they're signed at the very beginning of the service. It has a start and an end date. So if something were to happen in the middle of their service, we still want to make sure that they're able to meet that end date uh, and do all of their hours by that end date realistically, um, because those end dates can't be adjusted or changed. Um, it takes some very compelling circumstances for, um, for us to change the end dates to the member agreements. And then lastly here, uh, there is a whole training on uh, AmeriCorps Recruited Activities on the CNCS website or nationalservice.gov. Uh, so uh, you can definitely, uh, on your own time, you can look at that, you can go through that. 
Um, some flight supervisors even have, uh, especially if you have a full-time member, have the full-time members go through this. Again, training like this can count towards their hours, so it's really good for them to kind of review what prudent activities they can and can't do uh, during their service, especially if they go through something like this at the very beginning of their service. So that's a resource that is available to you um, if you choose. So any last questions about prudent activities, monitoring, and the support that we'll provide you? Okay, so I'm not seeing anything. So just some additional guidance on appropriate uh, service activities. So as I mentioned before, that non-duplication or displacement, so member activities must not uh, replace staff or community volunteer responsibilities. So again, that's why they are so project focused. We wanna make sure that they're doing very specific projects to really build capacity with, for the organization that they're gonna be at. So uh, miracle members and their projects should be uh, kind of above and beyond what, uh, what they would call a normal volunteer or a normal staff person would be doing um, at that site. So more expansive to developing things, they're expanding things. That's really kind of the, the core of what this program is really trying to get to and what they should be doing as capacity builders. Uh, some additional ones. So Kira, here is the uh, capacity building activities. This is the definition. Uh, that CNCS actually has and that we use for capacity building. So at the very bottom there, uh, capacity building activities uh, to be indirect services that enable CNCS supported organizations to provide more and better and sustained direct services. And that same language is used with their uh, theory of change as well. So uh, this is really how we see capacity building is it's really just intended to support and enhance a program. They're creating, they're developing things and expanding upon what's already there so that they can uh, really just have better or more sustained direct services uh, to wherever they're going to be at. So that's really our definition and the lens that we use when we uh, say capacity building type activities. Uh, also making sure that there's a connection, a clear connection to the program outcomes. So uh, the performance measures that you'll be uh, kind of reporting to us, just make sure it's connected to our overall design, to our um, to our program. So that theory of change, just making sure that whatever they might be doing, it's really connected to um, really building capacity of an organization or moving or improving your civic action plan in some way. So a couple of examples around there that you can read, but that's really what we're trying to make sure that it's really in alignment with what we're trying to do and identify kind of community problem that we uh, kind of stated in our theory of change there. Uh, administrative activities are generally not are not allowed. Um, so making sure that the member is not primarily doing administrative task. Um, so an example of that would be, you know, the member can't do the uh, all the majority of their hours just sitting at a front desk, answering calls, filing paperwork. Um, that wouldn't be an appropriate use of an AmeriCorps member. So they, they would be having to uh, work on some kind of a specific project for the organization, developing something, enhancing something, creating something. So uh, that's really the focus to the program. So any administrative tasks that are on your position description that you submit to us will most likely be flagged by uh, Volunteer Iowa and they'll usually contact us just to um, make sure that that's not the majority of the hours that they're going to be doing. So um, overall, administrative activities are not allowed with this opportunity. Uh, another one that's generally not allowed is fundraising. So um, I'll be honest, when I do the orientation with AmeriCorps members, uh, I usually scare them in this category because um, most of the time fundraising is not allowed. Um, and I usually just tell them once they get their timesheets, they're gonna be three different categories that they'll fill out. And um, there's a service column, there's a training column, and there's a fundraising column. I usually tell them just to ignore that fundraising column or if uh, their service site um, wants them to do some type of fundraising or there's some kind of fundraising event that's gonna be happening. I usually tell them to reach out to the supervisor, you first or to reach out to me just to make sure if it's allowed or to see if we can figure out if it's going to be allowed or not. And that's usually us sending an email, a quick email to Volunteer Iowa just to see kind of what their decision is on fundraising activities. Uh, nine out of 10 times, it's usually not allowed. Um, 
but there are some very, very specific circumstances where they will actually allow it. Um, but most of the time it's not. So usually I just have people just, if any kind of fundraising ha uh, comes up while you're at your site, um, you can't count those hours. Um, it may be still expected as a, a kind of a, a volunteer doing a service there, but just know that you most likely won't be able to count fundraising hours as part of your service with this opportunity. But again, have them reach out to us if, if, um, if that's uh, something that they do want to include or they need those hours, uh, reach out to us first just so we can see or get a, a final say so and whether or not those hours are allowed. I think this is the last guidance. The very last one is that direct service is uh, generally unallowed as well. So again, this is an indirect service uh, kind of opportunity. So it's all focused on capacity building. So the best example that I can give you is that if uh, a member is going to be at a mentoring organization, uh, the majority of their hours uh, should not be, go towards just mentoring a child at that organization. Uh, they should be focused on either um, recruiting volunteers for that organization to mentor a bunch of different uh, children, uh, building a new or creating a new uh, curriculum for the mentors to look at, uh, creating a volunteer generation plan for them, helping to create posts for their social media. They should be doing things like that, developing their program, developing their capacity. So again, some of the best ways to uh, train volunteers that they recruit is to serve right alongside them. So uh, that's one of the allowable times when they can actually do direct service. Uh, if they're training kind of someone else to then do the task, if they're trying to um, maybe even see if uh, a part of the curriculum actually works then they may need to actually uh, teach that portion of orbit uh, of it or uh, facilitate that portion of it so that's absolutely fine um, but again it just can't be the majority of all of their hours that they are serving uh, the other two kind of situations where it's allowed is if it's an organization-wide event that's happening so like a gate service and that's absolutely fine or there's any type of uh, emergency, uh, county emergency, state emergency, or anything like that, then they are allowed to actually do direct service during those times. So that's all the different guidance. So service activities, uh, fundraising, um, administrative activities, non-duplication, those are all the kind of the guidance that we can provide for you uh, for that. So are there any questions about just general guidance? Perfect. So, supervisor obligations. So, uh, reporting uh, reports are submitted on established deadlines. So, in the next slide that I have for you here are all the different reporting dates. They can also be found on your host site agreement. Um, assisting us in completing uh, the member enrollment form. So, once you have your members, the first step is usually having them complete the background check forms. Uh, we'll send those to you and make those available to you. They actually will be available on our website as well, and I'll give you the link uh, once I uh, send this recording to everyone um, in the next couple of days here. Um, but yeah, helping us to actually get those forms back because we need to complete those background checks before they can actually begin their service. So just helping us in that process. Uh, helping us to complete any fingerprint cards. So at the pre-service orientation that I have with your members, um, I will actually fingerprint them in person. But um, this is really for if maybe you recruit a member in the middle of the year and it wouldn't make that much sense for me to just drive up there to do one orientation for one person. So for those, I usually just do kind of an online orientation much like this with the member. Um, but then I would send you some cards to um, have them fill out and then they would just need to go down uh, to wherever, get fingerprinted, and then send those back to you. So just helping us in that intake process for some of those forms, uh, if need be. Uh, member timesheet monitoring and approval. So uh, really a monitoring and approving the timesheets. So you'll have access to the same timekeeping system, where, and that's where you'll actually approve all of their time that they are serving. So just making sure that you're uh, checking those uh, before you approve those with us. So uh, making sure that, you know, you know, if they accidentally put hours on uh, Christmas Day, Thanksgiving, and it was just kind of a typo, just kind of checking that first. Because uh, once they submit it to you, you always can kind of correct it and send it back to them or send it back to them for them to correct before you ultimately approve it into the system. 
Um, if it's already approved in the system, it's a little bit longer of a process and uh, we have to reach out to Volunteer Iowa to kind of get it unlocked. So just helping us kind of monitor those timesheets um, before they are actually approved. And then just communicating with Volunteer Iowa as needed. So in the middle of the year, uh, they usually do online focus groups with members and with site supervisors. So just uh, helping out our program, helping out our grant, uh, just by responding to those requests from Volunteer Iowa. So here's a screen with uh, all the different reporting. So for any of the returning supervisors, uh, you may notice that it doesn't look like it, but the reporting is actually lessened this year. So last year we were doing quarterly reports. This year, for majority of you, uh, you will only be submitting two different progress uh, performance measure reports. So you have that first one in the fall that's going to be due in January, and then your uh, second one for most everyone, if all of your members wind up exiting uh, towards the end of the academic year, uh, that second one in the spring uh, will be due in June. So um, if any of your members are going into the summer, then we have another September date. And then if any of your members are going the entire program year, that's what that December date is for. But for the majority of you, uh, there's only two times that you will we'll be asking for performance measure uh, reporting from students during January and June um, for this uh, 2019 year. Uh, position descriptions. So we need a finalized version of position descriptions five days before a member starts. So uh, we need that just to make sure that there aren't any activities that aren't allowed in there finalize it and something that is also new this year for returning uh, supervisors is that uh, the agreements that the members sign this year they're actually digital so the members will sign that digitally at the pre-service orientation that will then automatically be emailed to you to have to sign as well with that signature from you you also need to attach your position description so that's why we need those position descriptions as soon as possible um, for a specific member so we can review those and then give that back to you so you're able to attach that to their uh, member agreement uh, to be finalized. Other than that, uh, civic action plan report. So if you are, do have a civic action plan, you have members that are actually um, helping you to improve that. That report is the end of August. There are some additional program evaluations and narratives that we'll be asking from for members uh, this year. So 60 days after their start, uh, they'll be sent an evaluation or a narrative. Six weeks will be a different one. And then about halfway through their service, we'll send kind of a midterm kind of check as well. Um, and then they have an end of term evaluation that they'll complete. So there's more evaluations and narratives for members this year. And that's really just the whole purpose of that is to really track a little bit more their experience of them going through the program. Um, so they'll re be receiving that kind of throughout their service uh, this year. And then for full-time and half-time members, um, particularly, they'll have monthly reports, uh, monthly uh, narratives that they'll be uh, completing. And that's something we'll talk about at the full-time uh, member orientation, which is on September 6th. So everyone that has a full-time member should already know that date, um, but just kind of a reminder to the full-time, to your full-time members that they do need to uh, be present at that full-time member orientation because uh, that's when I will get their fingerprints and go over a lot more uh, of the policies and procedures specifically for them. So any um, questions about reporting? And there will be a performance measure uh, training. I think that is scheduled for Friday as well that will go a little bit more in depth about what the reporting will look like. I'll actually show you the form and everything. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, we simplified, uh, simplified it um, uh, really well this year, I think. So um, I think it's very easy for you to kind of look through and put in your information. But any other questions for performance measures? All right, so final stretch here. So part-time member benefits. So this is going to be on their uh, member agreements. So the uh, Civic Action Academy, that's going to be completely waived. There is some limited uh, funding available uh, to house sites or to members for uh, travel for that. Additional professional development and networking opportunities. So just because there isn't those um, training requirements, we still will have a lot of professional development available for your members to take advantage of. So we'll definitely be sending out those opportunities to them throughout the year. 
Um, upon completion of their term, um, there's a, a little under $1,300 that will uh, be a part of their education award. Um, and then members that uh, have any forbearance or any qualified loans, uh, the trust will actually repay a portion of that interest that had been accrued during their time of service. So those are kind of all the benefits for the part-time members. Full-time members, uh, they will be getting a, a living stipend paid out by monthly in equal installments from Iowa Western Community College. So um, just reminding them that um, our fiscal host is Iowa Western. Uh, sometimes we usually always get questions from full-time members wondering um, why they have to do um, HR paperwork or um, any other type of type paperwork from Iowa Western Community College. Just reminding them that's our fiscal host. Um, that will total a little over $15,000 over 11 months. Uh, full health insurance and coverage through Iowa Western if they choose it. Uh, they will have a pot of $1,000 for professional development. So any conferences, um, webinars, anything that um, professional development that they want to use that money towards, that's what it's there for. So please have them use that. So if there's a really interesting civic engagement uh, conference happening uh, somewhere across the country or a student leadership, something that involves something, some project that they're going to be working on, then uh, that's really what that funding is there for them for. Uh, civic Action Academy is completely waived as well. Additional professional development activities, their education award is a little over 6,000 for their service. Uh, forbearance still are kind of applies to them. And then there are some child care benefits um, that are contingent on certain uh, 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 income thresholds. So um, definitely uh, go to that website or reach out to us to see if maybe they qualify if they need any kind of child care benefits during their service. So the enrollment process, so I will actually go out and do a pre-service orientation, usually one week before the member is wanting to start their service. So before then, we'll usually send you background check paperwork. We do a uh, national sex offender check on them, a state check, as well as an FBI heightens check. Um, that paperwork will get that started as well. So we'll need that either the day of uh, the pre-service orientation or before then. If you give it to us before then, it would actually help out tremendously with kind of uh, the paperwork and making sure all those checks are ran at the appropriate time. Um, position description, so we just need that finalized version of that five days before a member can start, just so we can review that and give it back to you to attach to their um, member agreements. And then at the actual uh, pre-service orientation, I'll go over the program policies and procedures with them. They will actually complete their member agreement. So they'll put in their start and their, um, we'll work out their start and their end date. I'll put that in there actually last. So after you receive uh, the document to sign, I'll actually put in their start and end date uh, because of the very last point here. So I'll also help them set up their My AmeriCorps account um, and verify their account. Um, that ultimately determines their start date in the program. So that's something that uh, for returning supervisors, um, that rule still kind of carries over into this year. So there's an additional citizenship chat test as well as a social security number check that My AmeriCorps does to all incoming members. Both of those need to be verified before I can hit the button to start them in the program. So that's why that My AmeriCorps um, verification is so important. So uh, we will send that out to them before the actual pre-service orientation if we know who the person is. Um, and then at the orientation, we'll have them right then and there actually um, uh, and, uh, respond to that invite so that the verification process can actually start. But uh, just kind of a heads up for that, that ultimately kind of determines their start date in the program. So we'll try our best to make sure that they can start a week um, out from the pre-service orientation, but sometimes it may take a little bit longer to do. So we have one question. I know some American Vistas can hold a part-time job. What options, if any, do full-time members through uh, CCA have? Um, for this program, they can have outside um, employment. That's fine. They just need to complete all of their hours. So as long as it doesn't interfere with them completing their um, hours of service or their service site, um, it's completely fine. Um, it really just, to me, what I always tell them at their orientation is that um, we just need to see that you've completed 300 hours and that appears on your time sheet and none of it's prudent. Uh, none of it is not allowed. As long as I see 300 hours, then it's absolutely fine. So 
even on their timesheets, I tell them, you don't need to tell us when you're taking vacation leave. Um, that's something you work out with your site. Um, we just need to see that you've done so many hours. So um, that's the only thing that they're putting in their timesheet is the hours they actually do. If they didn't do any hours that week or anything like that, vacation or if it's a holiday, you don't need to put anything in those timesheets. It's just the hours that they actually do. So yeah, we've had members who have other jobs as well, just as long as they're able to complete um, their hour requirement. Um, other than that, um, timesheet tutorials. So I'll actually show them um, the timesheet uh, system. So we use Encore reports and I'll actually activate their accounts as well. So that's kind of everything that I go over with them at the pre-service orientation, um, which again is one week prior to their proposed start um, with your program or at your campus. And then going to the exit process here, um, the paperwork is really simple. So they'll have an end-of-term evaluation. Uh, you as a supervisor will have an evaluation. Uh, that's a really important document because that's how we actually, um, uh, we, we need that document to exit them fully from the program. There's a question in there that determines whether or not they can do AmeriCorps again in the future. So that's really the main thing that we're looking for with uh, the evaluation from you. Uh, so you can actually complete that prior to them exiting the program. So if maybe a week out, you know, all of your members are about to exit, you can actually send us their evaluation uh, just so we can get that process started. Uh, My America will actually send them a National Trust exit form as well in the system. Um, we can see when they completed it, we just can't resend it to them, um, but it really does help them out with some demographic thing if they complete that exit form. Um, and then all the evaluations and narratives are in their file. So just making sure that they uh, have completed all of those evaluations uh, that we send to them. And then uh, that member training certification form that captures all the trainings that they do. So um, just any time that they put down that they did a training in their timesheets, we just need a uh, explanation of that on that uh, training certification form. And it's a really simple form. It's just, you, they need to state what the training was, who provided it, on what date. That's really all we need to uh, see for that. So other than that, early uh, exit from the program. So our, there are some ways uh, that members may uh, exit the uh, program early. So um, if there's any compelling circumstances that are out of the members' hands, uh, they can exit early with part of their education award. So if there's a death in the family, um, for any reason, you know, legal reason, legal uh, reasons, they have to um, not stay at your uh, institution or stay in the, uh, the city that you're in. So anything that's out of the control of the member, um, there are ways that she, uh, they can exit early uh, for compelling circumstances and receive uh, part of their award. Uh, full time, uh, they can get a full education award um, and exit early. We just need something written from you and the service site that they're gonna be at just saying that they completed their hours and it's okay for them to um, exit the program. I think uh, what we would just wanna make sure is that uh, they're gonna have a start and end date. So making sure that sites aren't expecting them to stay all the way to that end date and they just cut out once they hit 300 hours and they're just kind of out. We don't wanna leave um, organizations uh, in that predicament. Maybe they're um, really expecting them to be there the entire length of their service term. And we always encourage people to serve uh, more than just the uh, minimum hours that we uh, tell them. So more than just the 300 hours, more than just the 900 or 700 hours. Uh, and that's really just providing a cushion for if Volunteer Iowa, for whatever reason, um, maybe some of the hours are not allowed and they uh, kind of get rid of some of those hours after the fact that they still are above 300 hours. Because if they get below 300 hours afterwards, then they technically didn't hit that mark and they may uh, not be able to access their education. Anymore. So uh, we just always encourage members to serve a little bit more than um, the minimum hours actually say. And then members um, are exited for cause from the program. This just means that they uh, will not receive an education award. And that's if they um, don't or they can't complete the uh, responsibilities or did not complete the responsibilities uh, for the program. So uh, members that just kind of go AWOL, they don't show up to their site and they just stop communicating with you, most likely will be educate, uh, exited for cause. Um, even something, you know, not as negative or bad. So if a member decides um, they're transferring to another school in another state, um, 
unfortunately is not a compelling circumstance, so they would most likely be ed uh, exited for cause and they just wouldn't receive that educational award. So those are kind of the different situations um, where members will be exited. And then the very last thing here is just uh, site visits. So again, we would like to come out and uh, definitely meet with your service sites that the members are gonna be at, meet with the men members themselves, meet with you all, see how you're doing. Uh, if any kind of grant monitoring or compliance things that uh, we need to bring up to you, we will. But it's really just to connect with uh, you all, get some pictures, uh, maybe even do some focus groups with some of the members, maybe the service sites. So it's really just to capture the great work that's going to be happening there. So that's how a site visit is really structured uh, with this program. So with that, that is it. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any right now. So again, uh, all of these trainings are gonna be sent out to you um, after the fact. So you always have access to them to kind of look back on and um, kind of uh, if you need some additional information or uh, wanna review some information, they will be available to you and we'll send any document that we're kind of referring to in any of these slides that will be made available to you as well. So one question that's coming through. I'm not seeing the full question. Oh, here we go. Okay, yeah, that's fine, Ann. But yeah, if there's no other questions, um, the only last thing that I'll give you is that um, here are all of our contact information again. So again, any questions about grant management, post site agreements, financial stuff, it's Justin, member training, member success, just compliance, management, reach out to me, and then anything to do with timesheets or enrollment paperwork, uh, Carly is your person. So uh, that is all that I have here. If you're a new um, site supervisor, um, that's all I have for you. Uh, you have a good rest of your day. If you are a returning one, I already sent this information out to you. But um, here is also the slide that kind of shows all the differences between last year and this year and all of that that I uh, kind of already went over with you. If you have any questions about any of this, definitely reach out to me. But this is kind of a, a quicker snapshot uh, for the returning supervisors of uh, the big differences from the program from last year to this year. So again, if you have any questions, definitely reach out to me. But uh, thank you guys so much. You guys have a good rest of your day.